Wayne Ashell is a 400 meter runner and hopeful for the 2012 Olympics. He's fit and fast, but not yet at the top of his game. Kerry Harrop, a biochemist at the University of Manchester, works in respiratory medicine and is developing treatments for people with breathing difficulties. Kerry's here to meet Wayne to see if he can help with her research and if she can help with his Olympic ambition. Wayne's personal best is only four seconds off the current world record, but he's hoping Kerry can help him improve on this. I work at the moment on a project that basically looks at asthma and how it's affecting people's performance, uh, specifically in sport. I'm not a doctor, but what we can do is run some really simple tests to actually look at how your lungs can affect your performance. If you're interested in doing that, there might be a few things that we can take from that that actually might help you towards your goal for 2012. I'll jump at the chance to, to try it, yeah. Brilliant. Shall we head off to the gym then? OK, Wayne, so one of the tests that we can do to actually look at your lung function and how your lungs are actually working is using this little bit of kit here and it's called spirometry and basically it measures two things it measures how much air you can push out of your lungs in one second okay and that's measured in litres per second and it, what it also measures is how much air completely is in your lungs and this gives us something called your vital capacity okay so what I want you to do is take a really deep breath in mm -hmm. and then breathe out as firmly as you can but then continue to breathe out so we can get an idea of how much air your lungs can hold Here's the first result. We need to look at these in more detail, so we'll take the results back to the lab so we've got a better idea of what they mean. To illustrate the difference between an asthmatic and a non-asthmatic, Kerry also takes the test and suggests they do it again after exercise. So now we've got mine and your results, both before and after exercise. So if we take all these back to the lab, we can have a look and see what they mean. Back in the lab, it's results time for Wayne and Kerry. What this spirometer does is it gives us two pieces of information which are really key to looking at the function of your lungs, OK? One tells us the total capacity of your lungs, so how much air in litres your lungs can hold, OK? When you breathe out and then continue to breathe out until your lungs are empty, where this line ends, which for you is at five litres, that gives you the total volume of your lungs. Now, the other really important thing in asthma is to look to see if there's any obstruction in your airways. Now, we do this by measuring how much air you can push out in one second. So we read up to what volume you manage to expel from your airways. And that was just over four litres. That's 80% of your total volume of your air you can get out in one second, which basically means that your airways are really healthy. If we take a look at my results, then you can see the graphs are slightly different in shape. So there is a slightly different airflow between um, my lungs and yours. And again, we'll do the same readings. So my total lung volume is only four litres, so that's a litre less than yours. And if we look at the amount of air I can get out in one second, it's about three litres. So again, that's 75%, so a little bit less than yours, but certainly within the healthy range. And what about after I'd done some exercise? How was the results different then? It shouldn't affect the total capacity of your lungs, because that shouldn't change during exercise. And again, if you read along here, the total capacity of your lungs is five litres, so that's good, that shows the test worked. And then if we look at how much air you can push out in one second, it's hardly changed at all. So maybe we should have made you run for a bit longer, I think. Mm. Because again, it shows really healthy airway. So despite your asthma, the exercise isn't affecting you at all. That's good. And how about your results? A moment of truth. The total volume should remain the same. That shouldn't change during exercise. And that's four litres for me. And how much air I can get out, yeah, again. Not bad at all, really. It reads off at about three, so 75% of my total lung volume. Where do you think the difference between the two of us is, uh, is coming from? There's a number of reasons, really, that it could be different. One thing, I'm quite a lot shorter than you are, so the chances are that you're going to need bigger lungs than me. 
Uh, the other thing is age can make a difference, whether you're male or female, what weight you are, because that obviously also determines your health. And the fact that you train very, very frequently, because every time you train, you're strengthening your lungs and you're also increasing your lung capacity. So that will show up in these tests. Okay, yeah, that's great. What I thought I'd do to help you understand how the lungs function uh, is I've got a little bit of a surprise for you, so I hope you're not squeamish. Kerry's brought some animal lungs from a butcher to demonstrate how they work. So you can see that there's two lungs here, and they're both joined here to a main airway. So this is your this is your main windpipe or your trachea, okay, and that runs down your throat. And when you breathe in through your mouth, the air goes through this tube, and this tube then splits into two and feeds one tube into each lung, okay? And that's what helps the lungs to inflate. So what I've done is I've put a plastic tube down into one of the lungs to give you an idea of what the lungs look like when they're inflated. So Okay, so you can see that every time you breathe in, your lungs expand, okay? And when you breathe out, they contract again. I've actually dissected this lung up so we can have a closer look at the structure. This is the main airway, or trachea. You can feel how hard it is. It's got little cartilaginous rings around it which help to hold that airway open, okay? And that allows the air to pass through that tube really efficiently. Now, the air travels down the tube and then what happens is the trachea branches into two bronchi, and here you can see one bronchus. Tiny little hairs called cilia in there, and the cilia waft any mucus and debris that's in that part of the lung up and out, and you can cough it up, swallow it, and get rid of it. And that keeps the airways nice and sterile. And as you get further into the lung, you can see that this bronchus branches into lots and lots of smaller tubes called bronchioles, okay? And this happens all the way down the length of the lung. And at the end of the bronchioles are tiny little air sacs called alveoli. Now, in these alveoli, is a process called gas exchange occurs, whereby oxygen passes into the blood and carbon dioxide passes out to be breathed out. So how do the lungs differ in an asthmatic? The actual capacity of your lungs to hold air is the same in an asthmatic, so you'd wonder why they have problems breathing. And the reason is it affects your larger airways. So this is the area in asthma that's affected. Mucus is produced by cells in this particular part of the lung, and that, again, helps to keep your airways clean. But if you get too much mucus, it can clog up this airway and stop the air going down, and then, obviously, slowing down gas exchange. And another thing that happens, which is very common in an asthma attack, is that these airways are surrounded by muscle, and when that muscle tightens up and constricts, the airway becomes narrower. So the combination of that and an increase in mucus can cause a lot of problems in asthma. I'm interested to find out a bit more about this mucus and how it can prevent someone from breathing properly. Mucus is a really complex mixture, so there's a lot of water in there, there's lots of different salts and ions and sugars and things, and there's these really long molecules called mucins, and imagine they're like sugar-coated ropes, effectively, okay? So they're sticky because they're coated in sugars, and that acts as a trap for bacteria and other pollutants and things that are going to damage the lungs. If you get too much mucus or mucus that's too sticky and too thick, the cilia can't move that mucus up and out of the lungs and then you get blockages and that can be a really serious problem in an asthmatic. Of course there's medication. How does that affect the problems you've just been talking about? Okay, so there's, there's two main types of asthma uh, drugs which you'll know about as we, we discussed that you take. And one of them is a sort of preventative drug, okay? Now that effectively acts to keep the lungs in a, in a calm state. Obviously that doesn't always work. And so you'll have usually a blue inhaler. And that's specifically for when you're having an asthma attack. And that works on the muscles around these airways here. And as soon as you take your inhaler directly into your airways, that drug relaxes those muscles and means that you can breathe normally again. Wayne's medications help him perform at an excellent standard, but in his field, a hundredth of a second can mean the difference between silver and gold. So Kerry offers to show Wayne some of her research, as it may help him improve his performance in the future. Kerry takes cells and mucus samples from asthmatic patients and looks at how these samples differ from non-asthmatics. This will give her further insight into the condition and may help her to develop new treatments or even a cure for asthma. What we've got here is a small sample from the patient's airways. 
Now, the reason that we're taking these samples is we need to get more cells to be able to do all the experiments we need to do. So in this process called tissue culture, we're just growing the cells up to get more cells, okay? And I should be able to show you the different types of cells we get in the airways here. You want to take a look, Wayne? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I can see a few things here. Why are those cells moving? They're the cells that have uh, got the little hairs on that we talked about earlier, the ciliated cells. So the cilia are still beating on those cells, so that's why you can see them moving. What are the other cells that I can see in this sample? Some of those cells will be the cells that produce the mucus. Kerry then takes these cells and stains them with fluorescent dyes, which she can view under a microscope. The slide shows the total number of cells in a sample. The ciliated cells have been stained green and will show up under a green laser. A red dye has been used to stain the mucus-producing cells. Why do you actually do these tests and what can you get from these results? What we're hoping to do is to be able to get samples of cells from different patients and actually characterise their specific condition. So in certain individuals there might be a higher population of ciliated cells or a higher population of mucus producing cells. But we're still in the really early stages of our research at the moment. So we're carrying on with this work to see if we can make any comparisons and hopefully be able to understand each patient's condition in more detail. 5.4 million people in the UK alone are currently receiving treatment for asthma. So it's hardly surprising that Wayne is not the first asthmatic athlete in the pursuit of excellence. He's drawn inspiration from famous asthma sufferers like Kim Collins, Paula Radcliffe and Rebecca Adlington, all gold medal winning athletes. For me and for a lot of people, it, it, it shouldn't hold you back from sport at all. Because, you know, I've, I've represented Great Britain youth team, I've captained England. You don't achieve those things by chance. It's by putting in the effort, by getting your body used to competing at a high level. Being asthmatic or not, for me, it doesn't make a difference. And I know for a lot of young people out there, it shouldn't make a difference. As part of her research, Kerry also collects and tests mucus samples from patients. The samples are separated out, depending on the amount and size of the protein molecules within the mucus. The results are developed and then analysed in this special dark room. What does this tell you about the actual patient? What we'd be looking for is any major changes in the amount. So if these bands were very, very intense, that could indicate that there's an overproduction of mucus, which in an asthmatic can be very, very dangerous. And the other thing that's interesting to us is to see if the molecules are changing in size. So if these bands are in a different place, for instance, then maybe the way the mucus is being made is changed in an asthmatic, which is something that we can follow up with further tests. One such test involves looking at the stickiness of the mucus samples, which is an important but complex technique. OK, sticky mucus, I'm guessing that's going to be a bad thing in a person. Yes, that's correct. What you want is mucus that you can move through your airways to keep your airways clean and sterile. And as soon as that mucus becomes too thick and sticky to move, especially in an asthma situation where your airways are already narrower, then you're going to run into real problems and it's going to really impair your breathing. Although currently there is no cure for asthma, Kerry's research is going a long way to helping us understand the condition. The idea that long term I'll be helping people. We're all kind of working to the same goal, which is ultimately to improve people's lifestyles. And for Wayne, the future is bright. My ambition is to reach the London 2012 Olympics and to win it would just be unbelievable.